Hi, welcome to the first ever Painting Lab Challenge. And to kick things off, I think we should jump straight into the deep end and make a painting based on this source image. And when I say we, I really mean it. So today I've decided to start this off in the most grand, the most ornate room in this fantastic Jacobean manor house where I now live and work and make Painting Lab YouTube videos from. So why have I done this? Well, because the way that the traditions of painting are portrayed often leads to a sense that you can only really do it if you have a natural gift. But in this video, like the previous ones on this channel, I want to try to take you inside the process of painting in a totally new way. I love the, the supported way to draw, to try something, and the open-endedness of the task. It's very, very simple to explain it, so as long as you kind of look at it and you're like, oh, okay, so that kind of goes there, and then, okay, so, you, oh yeah, yeah, I get this whole, and then you do feel a lot, lot more like you can do it. The comparator mirror reduces the distance between seeing what you want to paint and painting it, and that not only makes painting more accessible, But more recently, I've been discovering that it also will allow you to see through my eyes as I paint. So if you want to familiarise yourself, you might want to go and check out our previous content or Tim's Vermeer, the 2013 film where all of this began. So you can see my source image reflecting in my comparator mirror here, and I'm just gonna move back and forth and make careful, close comparisons of color and tone and shape, which it turns out is all that is required to make a purely realistic drawing or painting. So I'm gonna begin my painting by blocking in just a few of the basic structural forms, because I'm not gonna use the mirror constantly throughout this picture. The comparator mirror really is just gonna be a guide at the side. And of course, it's going to allow you to see why I'm doing what I'm doing in the moment in which I'm doing it. So the colour I'm using here is my first shadow colour, but I'm going to, once I've blocked in these basic forms, just checking the positioning of the chin there, chocking in a rough block of shadow for both eye sockets. I'm going to go into the colour mixes initially in a bit more detail with you uh, in just a second. So yeah, just a very rough basic blocking in of the forms and you can see by looking into the mirror back and forth with me just how approximate these forms are being. And when I come to my second colour I can adjust those shapes down and refine them a little bit. Right, so I've begun this painting with two basic colour mixes, a shadow and a highlight, but these are going to push up and down into lighter versions and darker versions as we progress in our picture. Then we've got a colour mix for the hair, and these are just colour mixes to block everything in, and uh, that's the colour for the background, which is more or less the same colour as my canvas. Right, now I'm going to block in the hair. With a big broad brush, I'm going to use a one inch wide filbert, it's synthetic bristles. A filbert brush is like an almond shape, so it's like a blade, very thin fine marks one way and very thick marks another. And you should be able to see that I'm already using the comparator mirror to spot things that I think need adjustment. So the depth of that area I'd left for the ear is a bit too deep, so I just make a mark there and that is much more, well, much closer to what I want. So that voice, that critical voice that spots mistakes, that tells you you've done something wrong, is exactly what I'm putting to use here. And in fact, although that's the voice that can lead you to want to give up on your own attempts, knowing that you can put that to constructive use, actually, I think, makes the difference. I've seen it make the difference. And the observations back and forth made possible by the comparator mirror put you in a better position to do just that, to do something with that negative, critical voice. There's so much negativity, absolute values of I can draw, I can't draw. It has so much potential. It actually 
blurs that and moves you into a more creative area of thinking. Right, now let's talk about tertiary colours. These are the colours that sort of sit between uh, the, the main blocking colours and which permeate throughout this picture. I'm seeing sort of peach pinks in that uh, space under the nose, rose reds in the cheeks, although I've amped this photograph up a little bit to accentuate that so that you can understand what I'm going on about. So basically, I like to include my tertiary colours between my first layers of blocking highlights and shadows. And I'm now beginning to block in my highlights with that kind of caramel colour. Now, I know that this painting, for a few minutes, is going to look like a real dog's dinner. And I've seen beginners make very good attempts to put these initial layers together, but often it's difficult to trust that when you begin to blend, like I'm doing there, with a clean, soft brush, that everything is going to pull together. And that mess that we had a few seconds ago is now beginning to come together. We're even able to get there something of the structure in details like the eyes. It's important to remember that each stage, each colour application is followed by a blend and that in each of those cycles of colour placement and then refinement we're able to tighten up the image just you know five ten percent. We're not trying to achieve detail all in one go and that's what keeps us feeling safe and confident about our process. And I want to show you that process in full today. I want to take this painting pretty close to our photographic source image. And although I have to tell you, this is one of the hardest things I've ever done uh, with a paintbrush, holding the camera, filming, looking into the backside of a camera as I paint this whole picture, I think I'm going to be able to show you into painting differently. So now I've stepped down my brush size and I'm refining the mouth. I often think about mouths as being basically four angles, two at the top for the top lip and two at the bottom, and a dip in the centre for the philtrum, that little dent in the middle of your upper lip. And if you get those four angles right, you can achieve a sense of likeness uh, without overpainting a mouth, which is a common problem. Right, in the details of the hair, I'm going to be much more expressive. I'm just going to enjoy the behaviour of the paint as I put one wet mark on top of another. And I'm just refining that eye a little bit more because everything in this painting at this stage is still wet. When I spot something doesn't look quite right, I can adjust it. And then when I've got all of that sorted out, I can move on to the next layer. So now with this eye, I'm thinking tactically about how I build up the next stage in this form. four marks there, including the iris, placed quite tactically one on top of the other, thinking about how I'm going to cut the next mark on top of the marks I've already made to create the beginnings of the complexity in that eye socket. And I'm going to come back here and work on that with at least, I think, two more layers of paint so you'll see all of that happening. Now I can refine forms with a, a clean wet brush by removing paint, but I can also refine them by touching in fresh paint with the colours that I've already used. And you just saw me do that underneath the eye and you're seeing me do it here. Again, I'm cutting in or re-establishing the profile at the side of the face. Because in order to get the precision within the eye socket, I needed to run those marks out into the background. But it's no problem to come back and cut back into them and re-establish that form. 
So I'm going to do a very similar thing uh, to refine the mouth here. I'm using my uh, half inch filbert brush now, placing a mark in and then cutting another mark over the top to refine the form. And really, I'm only worrying about one side of any brush mark at any time. Here, for the shadow, this little sliver of shadow down the side of the face, I'm only worrying about the side of the brush mark that's closest to the nose, if you see what I mean. And after I've placed in this slightly darker mark by the side of the mouth, and a few other marks around the mouth there, cutting one thing over and next to another, really enjoying those wet on wet edges, which add a little bit of a random element, a bit of dynamism to, into these forms. I'm gonna come back and cut in against the other side of that big broad filbert brush mark to reinstate that part of the profile of the face. And I'm gonna use exactly the same technique of mark placement and then refinement with another mark to refine the right eye. So I'm putting in the bluish whites of the eye, actually putting in a little speck of white in the far corner. And then I'm going to come in and I'm going to start building out the forms of the shadow in the right eye and the comparative mirror, those quick observations back and forth are going to let me build in those forms with a bit more confidence. I'm just going to reinstate some tertiary colours in the eye because I want um, a bit more drama and red in the eye, particularly in the tear ducts of an eye, increase that emotion in the eyes. So as I begin to put in the first inklings of the real details of the shadows around the folds of the eyelid, I'm already by this point in a position where I pretty much know where they're going to go without having to look in the comparator mirror. We've ended up with enough structure in that region to be able to put them in with a measure of confidence. And the same goes for the nostril and the details of the nose. There's already enough broad brushed structure there to be able to plot things in. And I can do that safe in the knowledge that I'm gonna come back and refine at least another two times. Just a touch of highlight underneath the nose. And I must confess to you that even though I'm a practice painter with 20 years of experience under my belt, there are still some aspects of pretty much any painting I make that um, can be more difficult, a bit more frustrating than others. And it's in those points, like I have to say with the nose here, that sticking to my process just holds me safe and sound. And I know that if I just keep going, I'm gonna to get to where I need to be. So this is our painting at a sort of midway stage and I'm going to allow that version of the painting to dry so that when I push up and pull down into my highlights and shadows now, we have a safe, completely dry underpainting there that can be got back if we are not happy with these fresh layers. So for our low lights, we've got the first of them, which is the uh, chestnut brown at the top there and we've got burnt umber mixed with a bit of cadmium red as our very darkest dark. Why? We can see it on the palette there. If it's used thinly, it will glow red because I've added that cadmium red and a similar mix of two further colors for the highlights. So now everything that you're looking at on this picture surface is completely dry. And you can see the evidence of that as I refine the white in the corner of the eye there, because all the paint on the surface already is staying put. This means that if I'm not happy with anything I do from this point onward, I can remove the paint with a clean, wet brush 
and I'll have exactly what you're looking at here saved under the picture surface. And although I would normally paint a portrait like this a la prima, all in one go, wet on wet, if you're just building confidence with drawing and painting, I would really advise you to use this halfway drying process to give yourself a kind of undo or a reset button. It will really build your confidence. Now, of course, I'm gonna reinstate the darker darks in the eye here. And because the forms are more or less put in place, we're doing this for a second time. And so I'm doing it with added confidence. So the way that I'm getting precision in these marks is to place the brush a little bit away from where I need the mark and then to apply pressure to the bristles to fan those bristles out so that I end up where I need to be. And in the lower half of the face, that if we look in the mirror here together, we can see that there isn't actually that much need for very dark shadows, just a little touch around the mouth and around the edge of the nose there and a touch under the chin. And of course, that big block of shadow right underneath the chin. And when we look through the comparator mirror, we can see that we have another layer of mark making built on top of all the previous refinements and marks. And now it's time to refine this fresh paint with a clean, dry brush. I'm just going to blend and just make some of those hard edges a little more subtle. And although I'm pushing toward my source photograph, I don't mind if my marks deviate from exactly what's in the mirror. Now I'm gonna refine the shapes at the corner of this eye by applying more paint, more of that initial shadow color. You can also refine paint by removing it, by pushing at the edges of things, and I've shown you how to do that in the first couple of uh, very basic tutorials on this channel, uh, episodes one and two, I demonstrate those techniques for removing paint to refine. But uh, pretty much throughout this painting, I'm gonna be cutting at the edges of things with fresh paint, building up one mark on or next to another. Now, as I refine the shadow running between the two lips, Yes, I am removing that paint and pulling it across uh, to refine there. Now, because of the comparator mirror, looking back and forth, I would imagine that a lot of what you've perceived in this video already today goes way beyond the depth with which I'm able to talk about what I'm doing. And I would encourage you to trust your instincts as far as that's concerned. Here I'm just putting in the beginnings of our next step up into highlight on the mouth and you get a sense of what that's going to do for us. And now I'm going to very quickly and briefly block in the fabric. I'm not going to concentrate on the fabric with you too much, although you will see me paint it in this video. I'm going to come back and do a separate tutorial where I really dive into uh, the processes for painting forms like the folds in this scarf that this young lady is wearing. For now, I'll just say that I try to establish some big forms with my first blocking, just like I did with the hair. And what you'll see later on is me refining and building complexity into those bigger forms, accentuating those shapes. And you can see me doing exactly the same thing with a big rough hog's hair bristle brush, brush in the hair here. I've got forms already in place and I just want to accentuate them and add complexity to them. 
In fact, the rough hairiness of a hog's hair brush is ideal for hair because it is hair and so it imitates the behaviour of hair on a human head. Okay, so now let's step up to another layer of highlight. I'm gonna run through all the colors in detail at the end of this video, and there'll be a challenge pack downloadable through the website so that you can see exactly what colors I mixed. Actually, the color I'd mixed initially was too yellow. So I mixed in just a little bit of cadmium red to get a peachier kind of pink color. Now these highlights are gonna seem quite stark to begin with as I block them in. And I just want to, you know, take the chance to play around with this highlight color, just see how it behaves as it thins out. Is it going to end up giving me what I want. And if it's not, I'll reconsider and remix the color. But I think in this instance, those softer, more subtle, scumbling marks in the lower half of the face, yeah, they uh, look just about right. So I think this is the right color mix after that little bit of adjustment to make it a bit more pink. So I block in the form and then I blend again. Just the same process as I've used throughout this painting, except that now we're stepping down the brush sizes. So satisfying painting this nose for some reason. I think, it, you know, cutting in against the nostril like that, using the shape of the brush, touching in the highlights, there are moments in a portrait where the likeness and the three-dimensionality of the whole thing really start to come together. And you can never quite predict when those moments come, but uh, this was another one of them as I begin to finally, with a dry brush, blend and refine that highlight blocking so that everything now comes into unity. Look at those stark hard edges there. And now look at the difference that a few simple blends make in terms of making this all seem like one consistent three-dimensional form in three-dimensional space with light shining on it. Now, of course, if you don't have a comparative mirror and you'd like to get one from us and join in with this challenge, you can do that by emailing us at this address and uh, then use this video as your guide at the side. Don't forget also that there are challenge packs for this challenge and many others downloadable through the website. And um, well, this is all an attempt to make these sorts of skills of drawing and painting more accessible and more comprehensible. And to make videos on YouTube that include you, not as a spectator, but as an active participant, even if your confidence to draw and paint has been knocked at some point in the past and your confidence to do something similar is at rock bottom. I'm hoping that what I'm proposing here is a new way in. So now I'm going to start dialing in the details of the eye and perhaps you can see why I blocked in the big form of the iris initially and left that to dry. It is much, much simpler to push in the colour to the edge and create that little rim of shadow than trying to draw it in with a tiny little hobbyist's paintbrush. And that is the second or perhaps third time I've reinstated that little triangle of white in the very corner of the eye. It doesn't matter if I have to do things more than once, but if I do get a form that I like accidentally, perhaps in the early stages of a painting, there is some skill involved in keeping it, trying to keep that lovely, fresh initial underpainting showing through when it has done something useful. And all the work we've done so far in this painting, giving me confidence now to block in the darkest darks of this eye. 
and cutting back at the edges of things with the previous paint mixes that are still on my palette. And from this point on, you're gonna be able to see increasingly how my painting differs from my source photograph, but that's okay. This is now about me making the kind of portrait that I want to make. I know the model in this picture and um, I'm now making a portrait of her, not of the photograph. Having said that, the comparator mirror comes in really handy for checking these color mixes. My initial highlight color there didn't have enough blue in it. Who would think that a painting full of peach pinks and rose reds like this would have a bluey tinge to the highlight, but it did. And I made the decision that I wanted that, so I've kept it. So before you see me put in my highlights, I thought it might be useful to have, well, I don't know, a reality check. So the reason that I decided to start the video off today in this fantastic dining room is that from skirting board to ceiling, it is full of the kind of portraits that artists like myself aspire to make. And although with a gold frame around them and hung in a fantastic house like this, they can seem like untouchable works of art. They are in fact part of that instinct to remake the world as we have seen it so that we leave something about how we thought and who we were behind us. But I would propose that the reason paintings like this have lasted, well, in the case of these two, 400 years, is that an image made by hand means more. Something about the way brush marks stack up creates a record of human thought. And that is what means that even if you took pictures like this out of their frames and out of a house like this and threw them in a dumpster, I think pretty much anyone would dive in there to rescue them. There is something precious at stake here, which I think we all recognize. And the flip side of this coin is that disappointment you may have felt about your own abilities to do something similar. The point is that it doesn't really matter if you're a Dutch master from the 17th century, someone watching this YouTube video or an artist like myself working today. We're all basically in the same boat. And perhaps you can see now this painting really starting to get a sense of three-dimensional depth. And if you are seeing that, ask yourself if anything you have seen here has had anything to do with talent. Perhaps a little bit of familiarity with the way my brushes are going to behave, but we've achieved everything you're seeing here through simple technical processes and the confidence that comes from working within a process. And all of that is made easier, of course, by the comparator mirror. The ear is really just an excuse to use that lovely thin to fat quality of a filbert brush to carve in those shapes. And I'm just gonna begin now to put in our very darkest darks in the eye and cut back un underneath that mark with our shadow color for the eye, which is already on the palette from uh, our previous pass in that area. Then I'm putting in that ridge of shadow above the eyelid. And refining the top edge of that with that same shadow color. And you've guessed it. Yep. Then I come back with the shadow color and I reinstate the shadow underneath the eyelid. And through this methodical process of working using that thin to thick quality as I compress the filbert brush and working in a methodical way to carve back at the forms that we want to keep, to reinstate the shape of things like this iris. 
it's possible to build as much complexity into a painting as you choose, really. So even though you may not be able to see colour in that left eye in our source photograph there, I know that it's there, I can see it in my source photograph, and even if I couldn't, I would put in some sort of colour in that eye, because just as I said a moment ago, this is now about making the portrait that I want to make. I'm just refining the details of the corner of the eye. It's all a little bit too bright, but when I come to blend, I know I can pull that darker paint down, and that's a little bit closer to what I want. Still a little bit on the bright side, but I don't think that really matters. I think we basically got the form that we need there. And then finally, the pupil goes into place. And we've almost achieved what we want in the eye, except that we now need to redefine the edges with that same background colour that we've been using from the very beginning. Now we're going to uh, take a couple of minutes to block in this fabric and I've mixed three colours for this. My highlight colour, medium colour, which is uh, looking the same as my shadow colour, but you'll see how these differ in a minute. Now I'm only going to really describe in very broad terms what I'm doing here. Basically the same technique I used for the hair, I'm reinstating or adding to the forms that are already in place and to show you just how broad and spontaneous you can be about this, I'm going to use a house painter's brush to chalk in those first areas of shadow. Now I'm going to give a much more detailed description of painting fabric and I'm really only just putting this in quickly so as to bring the whole picture together for you. But um, yeah, you can see that I can get a good confident eye full of information in the comparator mirror and then move away from it for a period of time, a minute or two perhaps, before just taking a quick glance to reassure myself that the basic forms are where they need to be. Then I can come back with my highlight color and refine those big broad marks that I'd made just to dial in the dynamism, I suppose, of these forms. And finally, to finish this picture, I'm going to take it off the comparator mirror. It's on the easel now, and as I finish the fabric, I'm going to talk you through the colours. So those initial uh, shadow and highlight colours were added to with two extensions, down into low lights and up into high lights, and they're exactly the colours I mixed. Then we've got our tertiary colours, which I put in the middle of that process when I see, saw that I needed to, and what you see there is our very darkest dark. And then we've got the colours for the fabric. And the reason I haven't put the background colour in is that it is more or less the same as that grey that I used on my canvas. So there they all are. You might want to take a screenshot of this image uh, although every bit of information that you need to complete a painting like this, whether or not you're using a comparator mirror, will be featured in our challenge pack downloadable through our website. I'm just using a rough old hog's hair brush there to put in the last little bits of detail and really enjoy improvising the strokes of hair. And that's our finished picture. So I sincerely hope that what you've seen today has given you a new perspective on how pictures like this, however austere, however untouchable they may seem, are actually put together. If you'd like to see more content like this, don't forget to like and subscribe to this channel and you can leave me a comment. But if you want to become actively involved, you can go to paintinglab.com, sign up to our website and in about a week, I'm going to be releasing the six painting lab challenges which will define my work on this channel for the next six months. Lastly, to get your hands on a comparison mirror booster kit, a selection of components that will let you build a kit like the one I was using today, all you have to do is email us at this address and we will post one out to you for no more than the cost of postage and packing. 
Until next time, and until the next challenge video, good luck with your attempts to draw and paint, and perhaps rediscover your creative confidence through those things. And I'll see you soon.